So, for almost all of history, Italy was not a country, or at least not a single one. Through till the 19th century, the Italian peninsula was divided into a diverse plethora of states, each with their own cultures, forms of government, and to an extent, even languages. Some built trade empires that extended across the Mediterranean, while others were dominated by foreign powers themselves. For well over a thousand years, the peninsula was in flux, and the different peoples of Italy considered themselves to be, first and foremost, Piedmontese or Tuscan or Neapolitan, or from any one of hundreds of other localities over the centuries. They didn't think of themselves as being of one cohesive nation. They were not modern Italians, and there was no real call for Italian unification. Not yet. So then, what caused that to begin to change? Why did Italy eventually unite, and how did it actually happen? Well, Italy's transition out of being a mere geographical expression, as it was labelled by Clemens von Metternich, began during the Napoleonic Wars. While under French occupation, Italy was administered as three units, the so-called Kingdom of Italy, Naples, and areas controlled directly by the French Empire. Still, it was the most unified that Italy had been in a long time, and that came with its benefits. The relative lack of borders allowed for internal Italian trade to flourish. Pre-Napoleonic Italy was still a largely feudal and economically backward society, but that increased prosperity, the seizure and redistribution of church lands by the French, and just a generally more meritocratic approach to governing, saw the birth of a rapidly growing middle class, the sort of people who would not be all that happy to return to the way things once were. Which is exactly what the great powers of Europe wanted for Italy after Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo in 1815. It was in that year that the Congress of Vienna, at which Metternich, as Foreign Minister and later Chancellor of the Austrian Empire, played a key role, redrew the map of Europe to suit the victorious powers of the Napoleonic Wars. The peninsula would not look at all the same as it had under Napoleon, as Metternich set out to crush any aspiration for nationhood among Italians. At Vienna, the states of Italy that had existed before the French Revolution were largely resurrected, though the centuries-old Republic of Venice and the Duchy of Milan, some of the wealthiest areas in Italy, were reorganised into the Kingdom of Lombardy-Venetia, of which the Austrian Emperor would be king. The Grand Duchy of Tuscany, ruled by members of his Habsburg family, was expanded, and the smaller duchies of Parma, Modena, Lucca, and Massa in the middle fell in line with Austrian policy, whether they liked it or not. In the south, the autocratic Kingdom of the Two Sicilies was ruled by a branch of the pre-revolutionary French royal family, the Bourbons, while in the north, the Kingdom of Piedmont-Sardinia, ruled by the House of Savoy, annexed Genoa, and in central Italy, the Papal States, headed by the Pope, was restored in Rome. All of which, quite frankly, got under the skin of a lot of ordinary Italians, who took both to scheming in a number of secret societies, and to openly revolting. Still, not much would come from many of that for several decades after 1815, partly because of Austrian intervention, but also because while most were dissatisfied with the state of Italian affairs, there was no unified vision for what Italy should be in the future. Broadly speaking, though, there were four anticipated possibilities. First, and most radically, Italy could become a centralised, revolutionary republic that would spread notions of popular sovereignty to the rest of Europe. That was championed by the firebrand Giuseppe Mazzini. Second, Italy could unite around its Catholic faith and become a loose confederation led by the Pope, an idea known as Neo-Guelphism. Third, the various states of Italy could slowly implement liberal reforms and then integrate their economies. That was favoured by Camillo Benso, Count of Cavour. Or fourth, the only Italian state, actually ruled by Italians, Piedmont Sardinia, could take the peninsula through military force. As for which one Italy would actually go with, well, none of those, not exactly anyway. Although the path towards unification would soon begin to look more clear. In the year 1848, from France to Germany to Poland and elsewhere, liberal and nationalist revolts broke out all across Europe, and in Italy, 1848 was the year when Italian unification, or the Risorgimento, began. The monarchs of the Papal States, the Two Sicilies, Tuscany, and Piedmont Sardinia, were all pressured into doing away with absolutism and adopting constitutions. The Piedmontese also adopted a new flag. 
Clemens von Metternich's nearly three-decade-long control of Austrian politics was ended by rioters in Vienna, and with Austria weakened, the famous Five Days of Milan saw their forces pushed out of the city, and then the rest of Lombardy-Venetia in March. The Milanese then voted to join Piedmont-Sardinia. The central Italian states also rallied behind the Piedmontese, though it should be said that their king, Charles Albert, was a reluctant revolutionary, but he did bow to the demands of his people and declared war on the Austrians. Pope Pius IX, on the other hand, hardly willing to fight devoutly Catholic Austria, chafed against his constitution and refused to help. That eventually saw his deposition and the founding of the Roman Republic by Giuseppe Mazzini and his fellow revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi in February 1849. But despite all of that success, things quickly went south, literally I suppose in the case of the two Sicilies whose king struck a deal with moderate liberals. They feared that their more radical allies would endanger their property. He was then able to recall his troops from many activity in the north. That sort of inter-revolutionary dispute was a common trend among those rising up, and it, along with Austrian counterattacks in late 1848 and 1849, saw most of the rebellions fail. It didn't help that their leaders were militarily inept. The Austrian Field Marshal, Joseph Radetzky, even derisively ordered his troops to spare the enemy generals, as they were too valuable to their side. Piedmont Sardinia's constitutional monarchy managed to survive the end of the revolutions, though, so Italy's previously unclear path was now set in place. Mazzinian republicanism would not unite the country, the Roman Republic had been destroyed and the Pope reinstated by President Louis Napoleon of France, who left French troops in the city to ensure order, and after failing in Rome, Mazzini himself was largely sidelined. Nor, of course, could the revolution-betraying Pope lead the way, Italy would have to be united under the House of Savoy, which now had a liberal twist to it, but the country would not come together peacefully. It also was clear that in order to take on Austria especially, the Piedmontese needed a powerful ally. So in 1853, their new king, Victor Emmanuel II, and his prime minister, the aforementioned Count of Gavour, the two men who would lead Italian unification from now on, sent soldiers to assist Britain and France in the Crimean War, in the hope that one of them would help the Italian cause, and one did. President Louis Napoleon, who had ended the brief Second French Republic and declared himself Emperor Napoleon III, was eager to emulate the achievements of his uncle, and he saw pushing Austria out of Italy both as a way of increasing France's and his prestige, and of growing his power in mainland Europe. It also helped that an Italian revolutionary had very nearly assassinated Napoleon III, and he wasn't overly eager for that to happen again. Secret negotiations between the French and Cavour in 1858 resulted in a Franco-Piedmontese military alliance, an agreement to work together to counter Austria and to split Italy into French and Piedmontese spheres of influence. So Piedmont Sardinia and France began to prepare for war, but the Austrians, seeing what was about to happen, struck first and invaded Piedmont. They very nearly reached their capital, Turin, before French troops arrived and the two nations forced back the Austrians, then invaded their kingdom of Lombardy-Venetia and defeated them at the bloody Battle of Solferino. A peace agreement was then reached, but the end of the Second War of Italian Independence left pretty much no one happy. Austria lost about half of her territory in northern Italy, including Milan, to the Piedmontese, and her central Italian client states had revolted again, then took some papal territory, briefly formed their own country, and then chose to join Piedmont Sardinia. Cavour and Victor Emmanuel weren't happy either, though, as the French had refused to push farther into Venetia after Solferino, as they had promised, so Venice remained out of their hands. To top it all off, Napoleon III wasn't happy, as his goal of creating a French sphere of influence in Italy was destroyed as more and more Italians flocked to the Piedmontese banner. He did get a consolation prize, though. Piedmont Sardinia begrudgingly handed over the county of Nice and Savoy, the ancestral home of the House of Savoy, to France. That had also been promised by Cavour before the war with Austria. The loss of Nice, which unlike Savoy was Italian-speaking, horrified many revolutionaries, including the old Republican Giuseppe Garibaldi, who himself was from there. 
Nevertheless, he was loyal to the idea of a united Italy, and pragmatically, despite his want of a republic, recognised that Piedmontese monarchism was what was going to bring it about. As the French and Piedmontese had fought the Austrians, discontent and a desire to join in had grown in the kingdom of the two Sicilies. That saw both peasants and the middle classes rise up against the Bourbons, so Garibaldi organised his famous 1,000 volunteers and sailed south. He landed on Sicily in May 1860 and seized the island without much resistance. Then he crossed over to Naples and by September, Garibaldi, his original volunteers, and tens of thousands of locals that he had managed to organise had, in spectacular fashion, destroyed the kingdom and prepared to attack the Papal States which Cavour opposed, not wanting him to gain too much power, so the Piedmontese invaded first. In October, Garibaldi met up with Victor Emmanuel II and handed over his conquests to the king. By that point, Piedmont Sardinia controlled most of Italy, and to reflect that, it changed its name to the Kingdom of Italy in 1861. Cavour became its first prime minister, Victor Emmanuel II was king. But his kingdom still lacked two very important cities, Austrian held Venice and Papal Rome. So Italy made a new alliance, this time with the rising Kingdom of Prussia, and together they fought Austria in the third and final war of Italian independence in 1866. Italy performed terribly, to be honest, but Prussia squashed the Austrians, so they still got what they wanted, although Austria insisted on handing Venice over to France first, as they thought that Italy hadn't earned it. Four years later, the Franco-Prussian War broke out, and Napoleon III had to pull his troops that had crushed the Roman Republic two decades earlier out of the Papal States to defend France. Italy took their absence as an invitation to come on in, and Rome was declared the capital of a fully united kingdom in 1871. Italy was now a great power, and it would go on to involve itself heavily, for better or worse, in European affairs up till the present day. Republicans like Mazzini and Garibaldi would eventually get some satisfaction though, admittedly long after their deaths, when the Italian people chose to abolish their monarchy in 1946. As for the Neo-Guelphs, not so much. The Popes have had to live with just one tiny city. You can find out more about how that happened in the video to the left, or you can see why the island of Corsica never ended up joining the new Italian kingdom. Also, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more just like it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss the next one. As always, I've been James, and thank you for watching Look Back History.